I've been looking forward to this Sunday for quite a while, and um, I want to introduce our special guest. Many of you already know Mark Leverett. Mark, uh, lift your hand up so everybody knows who you are. You'll see him in just a moment. His families are here. We have his mom and dad and his, his wife, Kim, and his, his children. You guys raise your hands, and maybe Mark will be talking more about them as as the uh, the morning progresses, but I've known Mark now for several years. He and I uh, work together on a board for Little Rock Christian, and his accomplishments are on the on the bulletin. You can read through it. He's got a list of them, a mile long, and I won't even bother going through that because what's most important is how much this man loves the Lord. He is as solid a man as I've ever met, and he loves. He loves Christ with all of his heart, and every word that I've ever heard come out of his mouth has been rock solid and full of integrity. And as I've gotten to know him, you know, one thing that, that I keep saying is, boy, it gives me great hope for our judicial system, knowing that he sits as a judge, and you guys should be very thankful to have, that God has placed him there. You're going to hear a powerfully sovereign story of who God is and how he is using Mark Lever. So watch this video, and then, um, and then after the video is up, I'll pray for Mark, and then you'll hear from him. Betty Scott Jones's family is now complete, now that all of her children are together. At 19, the West Helena woman had two small children and found herself pregnant again. She made the tough decision to put the youngest up for adoption. My granddaddy had died. So it wasn't nobody but my grandmother. And on fixed income, she couldn't uh, afford to take care of a child. So I had to make a choice. Throughout the years, she prayed she'd find the son she gave up at birth. She even had her daughter search the internet. Finally, I stopped praying that prayer. And I started asking the Lord, to, if, if I can't find him, then let him find me. He did four days after Mother's Day. I asked her if she'd ever been to Little Rock, and she uh, told me she had. And I said, well, uh, did you by chance have a son in 1969? And she told me she did. And I told her, I said, well, I'm him. Mark Leverett has a wife and two daughters. He's an environmental judge in Little Rock. Through the years, he always felt like something was missing. He had no idea he was living about two hours away from his birth mother. And when people would come up and say, man, are you a, a Camp or a Jones? You look and you act just like them. That's why he searched for her. It, it's answered a number of questions and, um, and, and filled a void. Uh, I, I would have always had a hole uh, in me, no matter what I accomplished, if I did not know where I came from. Leverett and his birth family are now getting to know each other through gatherings like this. This is just a amazing to me that God would work this out after 42 years not knowing where he was or who had him and then he would call. Jones who lives in Helena Arkansas doesn't regret the adoption she gave up her son so he'd have a better life she's proud of the lawyer judge and father he's become she plans to meet the mother who raised him soon. I told her that I should thank her for what she did for me because she did a wonderful job for me. And, and he's so, so mannerable. He's a yes ma'am and no ma'am boy. And I love that. You really couldn't write uh, a better movie script than, than what has happened in my life. So I, I feel like I'm, I'm um, just getting an opportunity to live someone else's life. This is uh, almost an out of body experience. What's so amazing is this story continues. After being adopted, I always wanted to give back to someone else who uh, may have been in a foster home and uh, needed an opportunity like I, I needed. And so we adopted a son, uh, Wesley. Two months after nine-year-old Wesley's adoption was final, Leverett found his birth mother. He believes it's God's way of rewarding him for paying it forward. Stephanie Skurlock, WREG News, Channel 3. You guys give God a hand for that. Come on up, Mark. Let's pray for Mark right now. Lord, we, we pray that you would rest on this man, that you would give him clarity, that you would give him peace and boldness to, to uh, speak what you've laid on his heart. Thank you so much for his story and the, and the fact that it points to just an incredibly sovereign God. 
and we thank you, we love you, we pray that in Christ's name. Amen. Am I mic'd up? Testing, one, two, can you hear me? Yes. Wonderful. Uh, thank you so much for um, uh, this opportunity to be here. I am uh, really grateful uh, for this wonderful opportunity. It's always um, a blessing to be in the presence of saints, and uh, this church is undeniably uh, a place where uh, God's presence is. I'm, I'm, I'm just happy to be here this morning. Um, I want to acknowledge, uh, it's already been acknowledged, my beautiful wife, Kim, uh, and my three most of the time wonderful children, <laughs> uh, Kennedy, Reagan, and Wesley. Uh, just happy to have all, all of them here. There are uh, two people who are not here uh, who are responsible uh, for having uh, given me life. And uh, that's my biological mother and father, uh, my mother you saw on the video screen earlier. Uh, but there are two other people here uh, who, uh, are, who took the responsibility six months after I was born uh, to teach me how to get through life. Uh, and that's my mother and father, Ernest and Jeanette Leverett. Glad to have you here. Uh, before I begin, I, I want to uh, thank my friend and uh, my brother, Harry Lee, uh, for his servant leadership uh, at home, uh, at church, and in our community. Uh, we are better as a community uh, for having people like Harry Lee around. Amen. Harry was responsible for uh, me uh, being invited to uh, share in this important service. Um, Harry was also responsible uh, for disseminating uh, some untruths. Uh, as highly as you think of Harry, uh, Harry has been lying uh, <laughs> over the past two or three weeks. Uh, so I, I caught an email. He probably didn't know that I was on the email chain uh, that he sent to the Little Rock Christian uh, Academy Board of uh, Trust that I was preaching uh, today. So I, I quickly uh, responded, uh, reply all. Uh, Harry has my gifts mixed up with his. I am not preaching. And I just say that I want to manage expectations. Um, uh, that's not what I'm doing today. Uh, the story that you, you saw on the video screen uh, turned out uh, great. And I, I want to talk uh, a lot more about that uh, later on in my comments. But uh, this morning, I, I want to start by addressing what I think is a very serious uh, societal problem that should command uh, the attention of the universal church uh, and uh, our community uh, churches as well. This um, societal uh, decay, if you will, uh, is rooted in part uh, in the plight of the orphan. Uh, I could overwhelm you with statistics uh, on the national problem of fatherlessness. Um, I could also talk to you about the statewide problem of orphans. Uh, who are in DHS custody uh, awaiting uh, a family. I could recount the stories that I've heard of DHS workers who, uh, with a displaced child nearby, uh, picking up the phone, calling foster parent after foster parent, asking, can you take uh, this child in, only to be told over and over again, not at this time. But rather than start with statistics and stories, uh, I thought it better to start with something that should move the heart of every believer, and that's scripture. What does God say about the orphan? How does he feel about the fatherless? As I studied uh, getting prepared for today, I found that there, there are more than 40 uh, passages of scripture where God talks specifically about the orphan or the fatherless. One in particular is uh, Psalm 146, verses 1 through 9. In, the, uh, in, in that particular psalm, David starts, uh, as he does with many of his psalms, with a declaration of praise. He moves quickly to a, a brief contrast of misplaced trust versus properly placed trust. Misplaced being in mortal man uh, who is powerless to save. And then the place where our trust should be is in an almighty God. He then lists a small portion of God's resume in verses six through nine. Among the things that he highlights are God's creativity and power in making heaven, earth, and all that's in it. God is described as faithful, 
one who executes justice on behalf of the oppressed. He's a provider of food for the hungry. He sets prisoners free. He comforts the hurting. He heals the sick. He loves the holy, and he watches out for those who are left out. But tucked away at the very end of verse 9 in that passage, he says something else that God is very interested in, and he wants his church to be known for as well. The B part of verse 9 says that God supports the fatherless and the widow. I find it uh, interesting that the very people that some of us find the easiest to ignore, Christ spent the majority of his earthly ministry helping. People that we find easy to run from, uh, Jesus Christ found irresistible. The diseased, the ethnic minority, the financially poor, the imprisoned, the public sinners, the homeless, the demon-possessed, and you guessed it, fatherless children. The Bible presents a very clear picture about how God feels about the orphan. Psalm 10, 14 describes him as being a helper of the orphan. Hosea 14, 3 says that the orphan finds mercy uh, with God. Psalm 68, 5 says that he's a father to the fatherless. And Psalm 82, 3 says that he's a defender of the fatherless. So not only does, does God think highly of uh, these children that are displaced and oftentimes left out, he also gives a stern warning uh, to those in, in how we deal with the fatherless and the orphans. Exodus 22, 22 says this, you shall not afflict any widow or orphan. If you afflict them at all, and if he cries out to me, I will surely hear his cry, and my anger will be kindled, and I will kill you with a sword, and your wives shall become widows, and your children fatherless. You think God is serious about how we treat orphans and fatherless? As believers, each of us are called to represent Christ on earth. We're called to serve um, those here on earth and to do uh, the things that he would do if he were here. Here's the question, I think, for the church uh, this morning. How are we doing as ambassadors for Jesus Christ. How well is the church caring for, helping, being a place of mercy for, and providing support for the orphan? We heard the scripture earlier that was written by Jesus' brother, James. He said that if you want to talk about pure religion, it's the one who cares for or visits the orphan and the widow. As I thought uh, through this, I think the, the thing that we need to, as a church, uh, the thing that will, will, will push us to and not away from the orphan, is if we all recall that we used to be where these foster children are. I know many of you are thinking that I was not adopted, I was never in a foster home, but spiritually, we were all hopeless and helpless. But the great news is God always has a special interest in helping those who can't help themselves. Romans 5 and 6 says this, For while we were still helpless, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. Ephesians 2 talks about us being dead in trespasses and sins. Now how much more helpless can you get than that? Uh, but in verse 4 Paul says, But God being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, he made us alive together with Christ. In fact, the Bible says that we are all, as believers, adopted. Romans chapter 8, verse 14 says this, For all who are being led of the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. If you have not received the spirit of slavery, leading again to fear, but you have received a spirit of adoption, as sons by which we cry out, Abba, Father. So all of us, according to Ephesians chapter 2, were once aliens. We were once strangers to the covenant of promise. We were once separate from Christ. We were once excluded from the commonwealth of Israel. We were without God and therefore without hope. And all of us were in need of being adopted. 
Now, as a result of God adopting us, we have all been put in a position in a family to get privileges that we did not deserve and we did not earn. And the church's grateful response for our own adoption should be to give the exact same thing that we've been given to some orphan. Help and hope. Now, what I also find interesting is that even if the church doesn't realize its role, the world does. I don't know if any of you saw the story that was run recently on CNN about a young man in St. Petersburg, Florida, by the name of Davion Only. Davion is 15, has been in foster care all of his life. His mother was jailed uh, early on in his life and died recently. He's frustrated by the fact that he's not had a forever family in 15 years. He walked into a church and stood in, in front of more than 300 congregants, and he said this, I'll take anyone, old or young, dad or mom, white, black, or purple, I don't care. I know that God hasn't given up on me, so I'm not giving up either. Davion went precisely where God would have wanted him to go, to a group of his representatives on earth that should be carrying out his will. He came to church because everything else had failed. His biological family had failed. The government couldn't fill the void. And his last resort was the church. Now, the great news about this young man is due to the national media uh, coverage of his story, more than 10,000 inquiries came in from not only throughout the United States but throughout the world wanting to adopt him. That sounds great, but what about those who are here in Pulaski County whose stories will never make it to CNN? Those that will never be featured in a national news story but have the same simple plea, I just want a family. What should uh, you as a church take away from my comments today? What should you um, do as a result of hearing this message? First, one thing you can do is to pray for them. Many, if not all of us, know an orphan or we know someone who's caring for an orphan. But some of us can do more than pray, and, and I don't want you to be guilty of being the, the pray but don't pay Christians that we found in James chapter 2. Uh, you see these kids in need, you have the means to help, uh, but you give them that old gospel, uh, I'll be in prayer for you. Um, so what else could you do, all right? Uh, you could uh, be a home that, that provides respite care, emergency type care. Um, I was speaking recently at an event with Milton Graham, who's the area director of the uh, Department of Human Services. He receives a call on his cell phone saying that there's been a baby at Arkansas Children's Hospital that's been abandoned and they need a family. Uh, if you provided respite care, you could be the family to take that child in temporarily until they could be placed in a foster home. Second step is you, you could become a foster parent, and you'll see some of this, uh, many of these items on uh, the list that you have in your chairs. It's also temporary, but probably for a little bit longer period of time. But it's just as necessary, and you get to show directly some child the love of Jesus Christ. Now, if you're not in a position to have a child in your home physically, many of us are not, then you should seek to, to financially support agencies that place children in Christian homes. Uh, I am privileged to serve, uh, and there's another board member, uh, Douglas Braswell, that's here with an agency called The Call. I can't think of any better agency to financially support. They work tirelessly to get children to equip uh, Christians uh, and educate Christians uh, and prepare Christians for taking in foster uh, children. Or, lastly, you could do what my parents did and what my wife and I did. You can adopt. Let me tell you, that's permanent. <laughs> uh, nothing about adoption is temporary. Uh, I, I want to be forthright with you. Um, but let me tell you a little bit about the sovereignty of God 
uh, in the life of an orphan that I knew and that I know very well, me. In April of 1968, an 18-year-old West Helena student got pregnant by one of two men. This was a major problem. Aside from the obvious issues that she was still in high school, she had a child out of wedlock, she lived in an economically depressed part of the state. Aside from all of that, the major problem was this child was her third. That child was me. She never got the chance to decide whether or not she would keep this child because her grandparents told her when she got pregnant that they couldn't raise another baby. They simply couldn't afford it. She had to give this one up for adoption. They sent uh, this lady to Little Rock to stay at a home for unwed mothers until she could uh, go through the term of pregnancy and give birth. On January the 19th, 1969, she gave birth to a healthy boy. She named me, um, I still don't know why, Gary Sinatra Scott. <laughs> I laughed when I found out too. Um, she signed over at that time uh, the parental rights uh, to the Department of Human Services for Pulaski County and went back to West Helena, not knowing whether she'd ever see that child again. Now, while she was struggling with the problem of too many children, watch the sovereign hand of God in another part of the state dealing with a totally different problem was a woman who couldn't have children. So the Lord led my mother and father to start the process of attempting to adopt. Now, please note, uh, their decision was not an easy one in 1969. This predated uh, the Angela Jolie uh, adoption uh, craze. Uh, you know, her family photo has got to look like the UN. Uh, she's got so many different uh, cultures in her family. But th this predated all of that. And so not only did it predate that, but in 1969, um, adoptions were not very popular in the African American community. It was, it was commonplace uh, for our community to take in a niece, a nephew, um, a cousin, and raise them. But to take in an unknown and to raise him was, was, was another matter altogether. So uh, when mom and dad started telling family members that they were considering adopting, some family members discouraged them from doing so. Uh, they told them that they shouldn't because you never know what you'll get when you adopt. So, but despite uh, the resistance they, they, they received from some family and the uncertainty of bringing uh, this unknown into their home, in July of 1969, they did what God called them to do, and that was to care for an orphan. I was privileged to grow up in a home with two parents who knew, trusted, loved, and served Jesus Christ. I was never made to feel different. Never felt like I didn't fit. Never felt like I didn't belong. I was introduced uh, to Christ early, taught how to work hard, and was told that I could succeed at anything that I put my mind to. Now, it was selfless enough for them to bring an outsider in, an orphan. But after I found out that I was adopted, uh, they engaged in another selfless act. They told me that they would help me find my birth parents. So I started this search uh, around the age of 18, and for the next 24 years, off and on, I was looking for my biological mother. About two years ago, I discovered what her name was, was Betty Scott. And through a number of unconventional methods and help from a multitude of people, some of whom I don't even know, I found out that she possibly lived in West Helena. Now, let me state parenthetically, during that time, uh, I was running for district judge citywide campaign uh, and announced to my wife, uh, to her chagrin, that I thought we should start the adoption process during my campaign. <laughs> that didn't go over well. Um, I'm thankful that I'm still married. Uh, but we started the adoption process with the, we started fostering uh, Wesley at that time with the goal of ultimately adopting him, which we did in May 2011.
But back to my story, I called a lawyer friend of mine in West Helena, and I said, listen, I'm, I'm looking for my mother. Uh, I think she lives in West Helena, and I need your help. Uh, I gave him the name. And the first thing he said to me is, wait a minute, I, I went to school with a couple of kids, and their name was Scott. So okay. He said, one, the, the boy was named Gary. I think, well, that's awfully odd. Uh, <laughs> so was I. Um, but then he said that she had, he also had an older sister. And I, I knew from my research through DHS that my mother had a daughter before she had me. So I knew I had an older sister uh, out there somewhere. Uh, we, for, we searched, got a phone number uh, for this Betty Scott in West Helena. And I was faced with the decision of what to do next. Well, I was afraid of making direct contact after 42 years because I didn't know what she had told her family. I didn't know uh, if she had forgotten uh, who I was. I had no idea how she would react when I called. So I asked the lawyer to serve as an intermediary and uh, to call this woman, tell her that I think I know someone that's related to you. Is it okay if he calls? He called me back almost immediately and said, listen, she's at home. She has her phone with her, and she said that you can call her now. So I called. I asked for her by name. I said, this is, uh, can I speak with Betty Scott? She said, this is she. I said, this is, uh, my name is Mark. I live in Little Rock. I uh, want to know if you've ever been to Little Rock. Just so that you know, I had gone through a process of calling Betty Scott's nationwide. Um, <laughs> and had been told over and over again, I'm not your mother. Um, but, but I will tell you, in, in fact, I did have, I made one call and the lady was so nice. I, I think she could tell that I was in, uh, I had reached a, a level of utter despair. She said, baby, I'm not your mother, but you sound awfully nice. I, I'd love to be. Um, so I, I wanted to make sure that, that this road I was traveling was indeed the right one. Uh, I asked her if she had been to Little Rock. She said, yes. I said, well, did you have a son in 1969? And she said, yes. I said, well, I'm him. I didn't know what else to tell her. Um, the first thing she said to me was, no, you're not. Uh, and I'm thinking to myself, that's not quite how I played that out in my mind uh, when I was thinking through how this would, would happen. Uh, so I said, yes, ma'am, I am. And she said again, no, you're not. And so I'm thinking at this point, this is going south. I need an exit plan. Uh, I said, ma'am, listen, I'm, I'm not trying to interrupt your life. I just wanted uh, to find you, to tell you who I was, to tell you that I was okay. And I wanted to make sure that you were okay. And she said at that point, you're not interrupting a thing. Baby, this is an answer to a prayer. Um, so I... I at that point, we, we talked uh, extensively. I, I had to go to court, and uh, she, she told me at that time, um, boy, you make sure you call me when you uh, get finished with court. And I said, oh, believe you me, I'm, I will call you back. Uh, she uh, did tell me uh, when I called back the uh, person that she thought was my father. Uh, she also told me that I had a, an older sister and I had an older brother. Um, I tried to contact the guy that she told me was my father. And uh, our conversation lasted about 30 seconds. Um, he's an old surly man. He's uh, probably 80-ish. Uh, I told him that I thought I might have been related to him. And he said, uh-uh. <laughs> I said, sir, have a good day. And I hung up the phone. I, and I just resigned uh, that I would ever have a relationship with my biological father. Uh, fast forward to a family reunion that we had in July at my sister's house in Tennessee. That was a story that you saw uh, on television. Now, when that story ran, a lawyer from Chicago was sent the video. He was a, uh, a former student of West Helena. When he saw it, he was stunned because the kid in the video looked like someone that he went to high school with. So he sent it to two or three of his high school classmates and said, look at this boy and tell me who he looks like. And they all agreed I looked just like one of their friends from high school. <laughs> Fast forward eight more months. Uh, my family and I are going to Chicago. We stop in St. Louis for a layover. We're walking through the airport terminal, and someone yells out, hey, Mark. So I turned around, and uh, Joyce, like any good politician, I smiled, and I pretended to know them. <laughs> um, 
I walked back to this, uh, to this man. The closer I got to him, I, I did realize I had no idea uh, who he was. He relieved the pressure by telling me that I didn't know him. Um, so I, I, I shook his hand. He started telling me that he knew my mother. He said, your, your mom, Betty Jean Scott. I said, yes, sir. Uh, he told me that he was a lawyer in Chicago. He grew up in West Helena. And he went on to say that eight months prior to, he saw this video. And he said, I, I noticed that in, in the video you uh, didn't mention knowing your father. Uh, I sent the video to two or three friends of mine, and all of us agreed you look just like someone that we went to high school with. His name is Denisio Howe. No, 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 no. Let me, let me back up. He said, I know your father. I said, yeah, I do too. I pulled out a picture of the guy that my mother said was my father. He looked at the picture. He said, that ain't him. <laughs> Try to wrap your mind around that. Th 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 this, is, this is a total stranger uh, in a St. Louis airport who's telling me that my father is not the guy that my mother said my father was. Right. Um, so I'm still trying to figure out where this, where this conversation is going with this total stranger in St. Louis. Um, and I'm stunned, and I know he can see it on my face. So I, I, I listen to him, and he starts to tell me about this guy named Denisio House. And he said this house fella and he were cousins. They ran together in high school. He said that this house fella dated Betty Jean Scott. Um, and I asked him, I said, well, how, how, did you, how did you figure that I'm related to him? He said, man, I've known him for 40 years. I saw you walk through the airport terminal. You walk just like him. You look just like him. And when I listened to the video, you sounded just like him. Um, now, he also told me, again, to, to show you the sovereignty of God, he was not supposed to be in the airport. His flight had been delayed. So he's sitting in a terminal with a delayed flight. He sees this guy that looks like his high school classmate and remembers a video that he saw eight months prior to and, uh, and calls my name. Um, all right, so at this point, uh, as, as any good lawyer would, I demanded proof. I said, well, who, you know, show me a picture uh, of this guy, because I had not seen him. Um, and so he pulls out his cell phone, and for those of you who don't know, I, I am an avid uh, golfer. Uh, I have my son in golf, because the Bible says that you're to train your children up in the way that they should go. <laughs> and when they're old, they won't depart from it, and they'll get college scholarships in golf. Um, so I, 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 he pulls out a cell phone and he calls this house fellow. Well, the first thing that struck me is he had him on speakerphone. This guy sounded like me. And um, he said, man, listen, I need you to send me a picture of yourself. And he said, okay. And he said, well, uh, by the way, how did you shoot today? And he proceeded to tell him his front nine and his back nine score. And when he hung up the phone, I, I looked at him. I just shook my head. I said, man, please don't tell me that that guy's a golfer too. He said, yep, every day. Um, so we, we, we get the photo in, and I'm stunned twice. I'm stunned because not only does the guy look like an older version of me, but I had seen him before. In fact, I'd seen him on the golf course before. Um, so I, I'm, I'm, I'm talking to the lawyer, and I, I said, man, wait a minute. I, I've seen this guy before. I've seen him on the golf course. He said, yeah, I know. And uh, I'll tell you this, too. He's also given you and your son golf tips at the driving range. I said, well, how do you know that? He said, well, eight months ago, I showed him the video. And I said, man, you need to sit down and look at this. Uh, and he called me back, and he said, who does that kid look like? He said, he looks like he could be my son. So, so he's known for more than eight months that you were possibly his son. I, I've seen him multiple times since the video is run. And he's never said a thing. Uh, so after the Chicago vacation, I called um, this house fella and was stunned at how much we had in common. Our golf handicaps are about the same. Um, obviously, our love for golf is the same. We even had the same type of golf clubs that we play. Um, and I was also stunned at how similar this guy was to my dad. Uh, both are hard workers, both Christ lovers, both war veterans, and both caring people. Um, to this day, I enjoy a wonderful relationship with my biological father and his wife, uh, my biological mother and her husband, 
and all of them share a great relationship and admiration for my mother and father. If you had any doubt in your mind before today that God loves, cares for, is concerned about, has a plan for, and can use an orphan, just look at me. I'm going to pray for us. I'm going to sit down. Father, we uh, thank you so much for this time that we've been able to spend together today. I pray, God, that you uh, would use your word to prick the hearts of your people, give them wisdom uh, in what to do about this problem of fatherless children in our society. I pray, God, that you would uh, get glory from what we do, uh, not only today, but, but as we move forward, God, after hearing your word, I pray that you would uh, just prick our hearts, God, and compel us to do what you've called us to do as your children. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Let's hear it. Stay right here. Fabulous. Thank you so much. Mr. and Mrs. Leverett, you guys come up, please. Kim and all the kids, if you guys wouldn't mind coming forward, please. Thank you so much. Powerful, powerful, amazing story. Let's, um, let's have a time of prayer, not just for this family right here. I mean, here we're looking at three generations, right? All the, all the sovereign hand of God. And um, yes, please come forward. Um, why don't we also have next um, anybody who's adopted or who is adopting or who is fostering or any foster kids, come on up. And um, why don't you all start by laying your hands on one of the leverets. So anybody who's been, who's adopted, been adopted or in foster care or you'll, you'll see we have quite a few here in the church. Would you guys come on up and lay hands on anybody that God has so directed you you to lay hands on. Come on back. Just you got to squeeze in tight, okay? Just squeeze in tight. And then anybody else that wants to come and just lay hands on uh, any of your friends, if you have a heart for somebody here, God's directed you. And then could we just have a time of prayer, not just for this family, but for all the families represented, for every child represented here. There's so many stories of Mark Leverett written right now, even in our own church. And we need to ask that God would protect and that he would continue to allow his sovereign hand to be played out and that we would be his obedient instruments and all this. So why don't we all pray right now? You guys pray under your breath, pray out loud, pray for whoever you're touching, pray for whoever God's put on your heart. If you want to come forward and just lay hands on somebody, feel free, and let's just spend some time praying. So go right now, out loud, all together. So, Lord, we are in awe of who you are when we see Senior Mr. and Mrs. Leverett, then Mark and Ken and Wesley, Rach, uh, Reagan and Kennedy, and we see how your hand has directed each of those. Lord, we pray 
that your strongest angels would surround each of them and bless them beyond measure today. That you would, in those deepest parts of who they are, give them such joy, such peace because of who you are. We pray for Wesley. Pray that you would grow this young man to be a mighty man of valor, just like his dad and his granddad that he would carry on this mission and vision that you've started, this legacy that he's been handed. I pray the importance of that would be firmly implanted within his heart and that you would surround him with loving people, your Holy Spirit, that he have a heart for you. Lord, for all the parents represented up here and all their children, God, such Amazing stories still to be written out. We declare that you are indeed the only one that could ever orchestrate this. You are the God who sits on his throne. And regardless of how difficult things may get or where people are, that you still have a plan, a redemption story to be written out. So we trust in your sovereignty. We throw ourselves at your feet. And continue to ask that you bless every one of these stories, God. Bless every family who's thinking about adopting, every family that's fostering, every child that's waiting. We pray for Braylon, that you would really give her hope for the future somehow. And that even in this moment, your Holy Spirit would speak to someone and draw them to take that next step to inquire about Braylon and maybe just get to know her a little bit so we thank you God we love you thank you for being such a good God to us and that you've given all of us by your presence by Christ in us a spirit of adoption so we claim that right here right now we rest in it fill us with that we love you we thank you we pray that in Christ's name amen amen you guys give God one more hand for Mark and Leverett and all his family. Awesome, awesome, awesome story. Well, now we know Mark Leverett can really preach, so we'll have him back again. <laughs> Thank you, you are dismissed.